In this algorithm, we will use the Pygame library as we have been using for all of the other tutorials. The data definition section includes first a hyperparameter called the map. The map, as previously shown in the demonstration of this algorithm, is represented by a list of strings, where each string represents a series of binary states that are going to be taken as the identity of each of the tiles as walls, if they are zero, or paths, which are ones. The next parameter is called dimensions, and it represents the total number of columns and rows that our map is going to be made out of. So you can imagine that the number of rows is the counting of each of the different strings inside of this list map. That's what is represented here. Resolution represents the dimensions of the tile. Because the tile is a square, we only need a scalar, one single number. The screen represents a very similar form of information as dimensions, except it is given in pixels and represents the total number of pixels that makes the width and the height of our program. To transform from number of columns to number of pixels, you just need to multiply the dimensions of each of these squares to the total number of such squares that you want. Display is a variable that represents the actual screen that we make in Pygame. It is created by accessing the Pygame and Display, the Pygame library, Display Soup library, and the setMode method. Notice that the method receives a tuple with two components that represent the number of pixels per width and per height. In line 19, we have a hyperparameter called vector length. This one represents the force or the length and direction of the line that we're going to be drawing from the center of each tile towards one of the edges. The data definition tile represents the basic unit of information in our program. Contrary to other implementations of cellular automata or related algorithms, this one is a little more complex. So let's decompose it bit by bit. The constructor receives the number of the column and the number of the row in which we will find this tile relative to the grid. Is wall is a zero or a one casted as a string. That is gonna later be used to determine if the parameter is wall should be a Boolean false or true. Answering the question, is this tile a wall? Yes or no? Cell.x and cell.y are calculated by simply multiplying the resolution of each of the squares or tiles by the number of the column, and the same for the number of the rows. To derive y. Rect is a compound object which represents the physical area, a rectangle, in this case a square, in which the tile exists. It is created as an instance of the rect template of the rect class and it contains the position x and y of the top left corner of that square and how much we move to the right and how much we move down. Is wall uses this ternary operator to determine if this tile is a wall or not. If the casted string of the number is a one, it means this is not a wall. Otherwise, it is a wall. The color is determined by the parameter cell dot is wall. We are going to pick green for those tiles that are walls, and we're going to keep it white for everything else. The direction is an interesting one. This could be represented simply with four strings, R, D, L, or U, representing the direction right, down, left, or up. However, in previous implementations, in Langton's AND in particular, we saw that it is useful sometimes to work with one-hot vectors. This will be particularly important if we start working with machine learning. Cell.center represents the center position of this tile. Notice that it is located at the top left corner in the position X plus half of the width of the tile. The same goes for the Y axis. So we're basically finding the top left corner of the square and moving half of the square to the right and half of the square down. That is this point center. Cell.visited is a boolean representing whether or not we have already added this particular tile to the stack. There is three helper functions. Draw simply draws a rectangle using the draw sub library from Pygame 
and direct method in lower cases. It receives the display, which is the surface where we are drawing the pixels, with this color and this particular rect component. The drop vector works similar. However, instead of calling for the rect method, we call for the line method. It receives very similar parameters. In this case, I just made a constant, the color of the vector, but you can also uh, create an attribute for it if you wish to do so. Here, we represent the coordinate as a vector, or tuple in this case, where the beginning of the line has to start. And here, we are going to call a helper function that will calculate where the vector should end. That is our third and last helper function. First, we're going to evaluate if this is a wall. If we don't get returned by this condition being true, we move into four different conditions. Let's look at one of them. Here, we're going to ask if the casting of the direction at the index zero, remember, direction is this one hot vector, one zero zero zero, which is right, because the one is at index zero, which is the first component. If we cast that number one using boolean and it returns and it returns true, it means that this point should end at the position that is at the center in the x-axis plus the length of our vector to the right. The right is added by adding pixels. And we should respect the position in the y-axis as the ending point. Compare it, for example, with this left. Here we're looking at the index number two, which is the third element. Right, down, left, up. So right, down, left, that's zero, one, two. So that is left with this index. So that is this index with the number two. If the answer is yes, we are still modifying the x-axis, but in the opposite direction. Instead of a plus, it is a minus. The data definition tile map is a two-dimensional array of tiles. We map by going through every single zero and one in the original hyperparameter map. And based on what we find, we're going to create tiles that are walls or not. So basically, all of this is mapping one form of information, which is a string, into a compound object, which is a tile. We do this using range. So for every row in the number of rows that we have given by dimensions at index 1, which in our case, which in our case is 5, we generate an empty list called tile row. And for every single column in the total number of items that we have given by dimensions at index zero, we generate a new tile at those positions, C and R, and we pass the zero or the one as a string that corresponds to that particular item in the original map. Then we append the tile to the tile row. And once we are done appending tiles to one tile row, we append the entire tile row to the tile map, creating the two-dimensional array. This is a compound data type. Therefore, we must have a way or template to make the process of traversing this compound object much more easily. So we will rely on a two-dimensional for loop that is going to go through every single tile row and for every tile row, we go through every tile. These three dots, remember, represent the implementation of an action or function that is going to receive or modify the tile. We don't know what that function is, and we, are not, and we don't need to know, because this is a template. However, this time, we are going to exploit the use of a higher order function. These are not new. If you have followed previous tutorials, you may already feel a bit familiar with those. However, for the first time, we're going to be using it extensively. You'll see how much easier it is to read the code. So, font for tile map receives a function as a parameter and a series of arguments that we don't really know yet. So, 
we take the two parts of our template for tilemap and we pass instead of these three dots our function fn which is the action we want to apply to each of the tiles and we pass the arguments the next data definition is the target tile the target tile is simply one of the tiles in the grid reference by using the tile map which is the two-dimensional grid at a particular row and a particular column we change the color of that tile in order to visualize it much more easily and we change its state from false to true then we add it to a stack the stack is a compound data type of type list made out of tiles and it simply represents all of the tiles that we have observed and we still need to process now that we have this information ready let's just start implementing the code okay this is where the good stuff is we're going to start by defining a draw and an update function remember the pygame library always requires us to use these two functions in one way or another we're going to run each of this forever or until we close the application ourselves by using an infinite loop the draw function is in charge of rendering pixels that's the only thing it does and it is done in generally speaking in three parts the first one is by changing the background color in this case i'm just gonna opt for this color that is the same as what we are seeing in vs code i'm gonna add a dot 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 here because i know i need to apply an action but i don't know what it's gonna be yet and finally we add a handshake between python and the real programming language that is running this behind the scenes because python doesn't really have the power of asynchronously deal with multiple inputs and render images okay so what's happening here we need our window to be interactive if i run the program right now and hopefully there is no errors I'm going to have a window right there of the desired dimensions but if I click on it and try to move it the program stops responding and the reason why this happens is because our window is not interactive to solve this issue we need to tell the program that we want to listen to whatever the user is uh, modifying from the system that we are working with <clears throat> so we do that using a for loop so for every event in the list of events that Pygame has. If the event is of type quit, we quit the application by using the quit method. If we run the program once more, this time we'll be able to move the window around and everything's still working. Okay, so what do we need to do here? the first thing we will do is to draw every single tile then we're gonna draw every single vector for each of the different tiles we're gonna use the higher order function font font for tile map and we're gonna pass from the tile template the draw function so here I'm simply passing a function to somebody else so that that somebody else can run it if I run the program once more I have my maze and this almost looks like cheating it was way too simple but the reason why it is simple is because we spent a lot of time describing very carefully the data definitions that enter our program we had a template let's close this once more and let's just copy this because I am being efficient or lazy depending on your on your point of view and here I'm just gonna call the second helper function which you probably guessed is draw vector if I run this right now this time I have all of the different vectors for those tiles that are not walls if the tile is a wall you just see a dot in there that it almost looks like a stain in my computer okay so I'm gonna close this and we are good to go let's focus in the algorithm that's the meatballs in the pasta 
The general idea is to ask if there is still anything in the stack. If the answer is yes, then we are going to update the tile by passing a tile, which in our case will always, always be the first item inside of the stack. Remember, we are always picking the element in the stack, processing it, calculating the neighbors, and then getting rid of that item by using pop. So we say stack.pop, and we pick the index 0. So this update tile is going to be a helper function. Let's put it over here. Of the tile will receive a tile. There is no surprises there. So update tile is going to start by first adding R and C. We don't have to create them, but I think the visualization is much easier to analyze. This is going to be the tiles R and this is going to be the tiles C. Right? We're just saving four words and one period there. And you'll see why right now. So first we're going to ask if there is a neighbor to the right. So what does this mean? So we may have a tile that is in one of the edges. right? If I am looking at a tile that is at the very, very right edge, there is no neighbor to the right there. In previous implementations, we consider the elements or tiles in the opposite side of the screen to be that neighbor. But in this case, that doesn't apply because it would mess things up with the path. So we need to ask if the column is less than the last element in the columns minus one. And the reason why we use minus one is because in the next line, we're going to be trying to access the element to the right of this current column. If this was the very last column, and I try to access the column to the right of there, the column to the right, I'm going to get an index error. There is just no element to the right. So that's why this minus one is here. And we're going to ask if it is not true that the tile map at the position R and C plus 1 is visited. This is to say that if this tile, if this neighbor tile that is assumed to exist, because if we find this relational expression after the end, therefore this first relational expression must be true. So there is assumed to be a neighbor in there. And if that neighbor hasn't been visited and if that neighbor is not a wall either, then we can proceed. We are going to create a new variable neighbor and we're going to make it equal to this tile map dot visited. We are going to update the direction of this neighbor. If the neighbor to the right exists and has been visited and now added to the stack, it means that the direction in which this neighbor should be pointing should be the opposite to the right direction. Therefore, this is going to be the left direction, 0, 0, 1, 0. Remember, in a clockwise direction, starting with, starting with right. Right, down, left up. Then we are going to add this neighbor to the stack. And finally, we are going to call this neighbor visited. Through the magic of video editing, I'm going to finish the other three cases. I recommend you to pause this video and try to figure out the other cases yourself if you are one of those people that like coding along. Regardless, I'll see you in a minute. OK, so here we are. Just as a quick review. To go down, we ask the same question that we asked for right, but using R. And we are going to be looking at the element at the tile map at this position R and C, but looking at the row below. The direction, if we are going down, should be up. 
which is the last element. And the last elements are the same. We append the neighbor to the stack and we mark this neighbor as visited. The same goes for left, but we change the sign. The same goes for up, but we change the sign. Let's run this and let's see what happens. Oops, we got an error. The error reads, Boolean object has no attribute direction. And that is in line 114. Let's take a look. Oh, I see my mistake. This should not say visited. Because visited is an attribute of a tile and that's not what I want to call neighbor. I want to call neighbor the actual tile. Let's run this once more and there it is. We have a path. This means that it doesn't matter where you start in this maze. If there is a path that leads to the orange tile, you should find it. Here we have another flavor of the same algorithm. However, in this version, I have added particles that after the paths have been solved, allow the particles to activate themselves and based on the tile that they are overlapping, they start moving in the direction that leads them to the exit.